Hello everybody, Mike here with Pilot Reports. Um, welcome to my channel. For those of you that subscribe, welcome back. Um, if you don't subscribe, hit that subscribe button, the like button, and the, uh, the bell, and you'll be notified of my next videos coming out. Um, but I know it's been a while since I did a video. I think the last one was the Ocean City, Maryland trip. And the reason why is uh, I planned on doing some upgrades to the, uh, the gauges in the aircraft, right? I was gonna upgrade the attitude indicator to the AV-30. I'm upgrading the G5 um, or the HSI to the G5. So I have a little bit of glass there. I'm also gonna be uh, replacing the engine gauges coming up with some two uh, CGR-30s. So I'm gonna have a little bit of glass for my uh, primary instruments and uh, also my engine instruments. So uh, I'll be doing some reviews coming up on those. But since we were taking the panel apart for the AV-30, what we found was my airspeed indicator um, from 1959. The housing was actually cracked. So, uh, so the people at uh, quality or aircraft quality instruments um, called them up. They customized an airspeed indicator, actually rebuilt one, customized it to, uh, to my color pattern um, for the airspeed gauge. And uh, sent that up so i've got to run down and put this in the uh the plane with the mechanic um later today but while i was waiting for that what i did was i took the housing off that was cracked of the airspeed indicator and what i want to do is run you through this contraption show you how this diaphragm works how this linkage works um the colors on the display what they mean why there's two different arcs um, if you've never seen an airspeed indicator like this and uh, kind of run through some tests and maybe help you understand the errors that can happen with an airspeed indicator or how it normally functions. So first let's talk about the airspeed indicator and the markings that we see on the faceplate here. Um, with this airspeed indicator, you can see the outer ring will be in miles per hour and the inner ring will be in knots. Back in my 1959, uh, the preferred method of measuring airspeed was in miles per hour. That's why the outer ring is in miles per hour. Um, they were using knots too, but they, uh, again, the preferred method was miles per hour. Um, now, since then, they now prefer knots. So most airspeed indicators will have the knots on the outer ring and miles per hour on the inner ring, or just knots in general with no miles per hour. Interesting fact, if you didn't know, if you take your knots, times it by 1.15 or 15% more, you'll get your miles per hour. And of course, dividing it or 15% less of miles per hour would be your equivalent in knots. So uh, a little fun fact for those that like to do the conversion when flying and telling their friends how fast they're flying. Then we have a couple um, arcs here. We have a white arc, a green arc, a yellow arc and a red line all marked on the airspeed indicator. Now most pilots know what these mean, but I'm gonna do a quick refresher to uh, demonstrate for the non-pilots or the people learning what these arcs mean. So first we'll look at this white arc and uh, it's really your slow um, maneuvering speed arc as far as uh, the bottom is gonna be your stall speed or your VSO. That's with your flaps extended, gear extended, and really in the landing configuration, right? And then uh, at the top of this white arc right here is gonna be your flap extension speed. So this is gonna be your slow flying speed or uh, your landing phase speeds is gonna be within this white arc. Now the top uh, could be flaps fully extended, could be flaps partially extended. Um, it really is up to the manufacturer to decide um, what the top of that white arc is going to uh, determine. In my aircraft, the top of the white arc is gonna be flaps um, either partially or fully extended. Sometimes uh, if you had an approach flap setting, it might be higher and not depicted on the airspeed indicator, um, but the white arc is always your, again, your landing configuration, typically full flaps and landing gear down. And then you have this other arc, which is your green arc. That's your normal operating speed. At the bottom of the green arc is gonna be your stall speed in the clean configuration, or uh, flaps up, gear up uh, configuration. And the top is gonna to be um, your fastest speed uh, to fly in, in normal configuration. Um, now, you can operate within this arc and uh, pretty be pretty safe as far as structural uh, integrity. Of course, there is the VA speed um, that's not depicted on the airspeed indicator, which is the maneuvering speed, but we can talk about that um, another day. Then we have our yellow arc, which ex exceeds or extends from the VNO, which is the normal operating speed, which is the between the yellow and that green arc, 
and VNE, which is the red line, right? VNE would stand for the, the speed to never exceed, and then the VNO would be the top of the normal operating speed. So what you can do in this arc is operate in very smooth air or air you don't expect turbulence in, um, where it won't cause any damage, um, but it's really safe to just stay in the green arc, so that way you have a good buffer factor. And of course, red line VNE would be the never exceed, so this is an area you would never want to operate, right? And the inside ring would be the knots uh, conversion for the miles per hour, right? Now, what I did on my airspeed indicator, being that I have a gear extension speed at 123 knots, I had them put a blue line um, right at the 123 knot uh, mark on the new airspeed indicator, just a friendly reminder to be below that for my gear extension. Now, in multi-engine planes, blue line means the VY, or the uh, best rate of climb for single engine, um, but for, for a single engine plane, the blue line really means nothing except for a reminder for myself. Okay, and that's how this faceplate um, is depicted. Now, as many as you uh, probably heard in your in your private pilot training, the uh, airspeed indicator consists of the pitot system and what we call the uh, the static system, which are these two ports that would be on the housing of this airspeed indicator, right? The middle one being the pitot, which would take the ram air from the pitot tube and take that pressure, and then the static air would be just normal air pressure and uh, fill the, the enclosed housing that I tore apart here, All right? So most instructors just say, well, the airspeed indicator consists of the, uh, the ram air moving a diaphragm to a series of linkage that moves the needle, which they are right on, um, but they really don't get into this, uh, this linkage here, which I want to uh, talk about and uh, kind of show you a little closer, right? So air fills this pitot tube, um, or the pitot tube on the outside of the plane, goes all the way through a series of tubes to this port and fills this diaphragm. And when this diaphragm moves and expands, you can see it moves the needle. So what that diaphragm um, is, is a sealed up wafer that if it is um, breached or has a hole in it, then your airspeed indicator won't read accurately because it needs that, that constant pressure. And it's basically like a balloon um, right here. Okay, and this one's made out of metal um, from the 1959 that uh, it was pulled out of. And it also has these little um, metal pins in here, which you can kind of see um, right here. Now these are actually called retainer springs, and uh, what retainer springs do is they, um, they basically force this wafer back to zero and uh, get the needle back to zero, um, so that way uh, the air's pressure, when, when you're all finished flying or there's no air pressure in here, it goes back to zero. So that's just basically a metal bar in, uh, in there that uh, kind of pushes back on this wafer as the retainer spring, right? So it's basically a reset right, right there. Now what happens is this wafer, as it expands, contracts, it'll push on this uh, rocker shaft or rocking shaft right here. So, uh, so as you can see, if we, uh, we move this arm right, right back here is where this wafer would connect and move this, this little arm right right there. And as you can see, as I move that little arm, it'll actually spin the rocking shaft, which will actually move the needle to the, uh, to the appropriate airspeed, right? So that wafer touches that arm, which then spins this rocking shaft and makes it into an axial rotation, which then connects later on to gears to this needle here. Okay, so then from this rocking shaft, um, we have another shaft uh, right here. It's a longer arm, right? This long arm that goes from this side all the way into there and connects to this, uh, let's get to it, this sector right here, which you can see is uh, basically just a cog, like a quarter of a cog. And as that moves, that's gonna start rotating the airspeed, right? You see as, that, as I move that, the airspeed rotates, and uh, that sector is connected to uh, the hand staff pin. Now this being the hand staff, right, has a little bit of pin with a cog on it. So as that sector moves, it moves that airspeed indicator to the right airspeed. 
Now, for something built in 1959, um, this is, I, I feel pretty incredible. It's very small, very tiny, all hand done, no uh, computers or robots to help them, and uh, fine-tuned instrument that was really accurate, um, until mine, of course, cracked, but uh, a really accurate um, way to display your airspeed, okay? So let's take a minute to talk about outside air um, pressure or density or the, what, what's actually in the air, right? So as we go up in altitude, we lose the amount of air molecules that are uh, within the air, right? So let's just say at a, an altitude of sea level or zero feet, um, we have a hundred parts of, of molecules in the air for a given space, right? So in this airspeed indicator, this will be an actual enclosure that's sealed up. And let's say we could put a hundred particles of air in that sealed enclosure or housing, right? Now, if we go up to let's say 18,000 feet, instead of having a hundred molecules of air, we'll have, let's say 50 molecules of air or actually half and 18,000 feet um, is actually where half of the atmosphere uh, falls below. So that's where you'll have half the molecules. So if you take that same amount of space, go up to 18,000 feet, um, you'll have about half as many molecules in that, that area. And uh, you'll have 50 if let's say we had 100 down at sea level. Now, how is that important for the airspeed indicator, right? Now, let me run you through how this works. So in this housing at sea level, we'll have a hundred parts of air, right? Now let's say um, we're running or flying along and we have 200 parts of air coming into here. Well, this diaphragm will expand via the pressure and give us a reading on the airspeed indicator, right? So if we have a hundred parts of air filling this spot, 100 parts of air filling this spot, then our airspeed indicator will read zero. So really you can think about our airspeed indicator as a comparison between outside air pressure and the air pressure coming in here or what we call the ram air pressure, right? So if this equals the inside housing, we'll get a reading of zero. If we have more air in here, there are more molecules going into here, then in here we're gonna start getting a reading on our airspeed indicator, okay? So that's the basics of that. Now, why do we need a static port? Is really, it helps compensate for the changes in pressure as we, we go up, right? So in this housing at sea level, let's say we have 100 air molecules, and again, more in coming in here, or 200. Well, let's go up to 18,000 feet. Well, if we take that static port, that port right here, and we measure the outside pressure, um, we'll have, let's say, 50 molecules of air um, in this housing, right? Well, air coming into here is no longer gonna be 200, it's gonna be 100. So that's how we compare the ram air to the static air, right? So you'll have 100 coming into here, you'll have 50 in that box, still keeping that two to one ratio of two parts of air in there compared to the one part of air in that sealed housing, okay? And of course, as you go up, you have less molecules in the air and it'll just take the ratio between the outside static air, the outside pressure or molecules and the ram air molecules and again, convert it to a reading on our airspeed indicator. Now it's important to understand these concepts because then we can understand errors that happen with the pedostatic system, right? Now let's just say we didn't have the static port uh, connected and we just sealed this up at sea level, right? So let's say we sealed it up at 100 molecules of air um, within that housing. Well, when we're flying along in the ground or at sea level, um, we have 200 molecules going into this pedo port and it'll convert to a reading. It'll be accurate, right? On a standard day or when the day matches what they sealed this unit up with. Now, let's say we go up to that 18,000 feet. Uh, what's gonna happen is instead of 200 parts of air or molecules of air coming into this port, we're only gonna have 100. Well, if this unit was sealed up with 100 parts, you would have 100 here, 100 in here, 
your airspeed indicator would actually read zero, right? So that's where we can kind of correlate that to clogged static systems. So let's say you're flying along and a bug somehow gets in the static port or uh, someone leaves tape over it when they were washing the plane or painting the plane. Um, that will simulate as if this area was sealed up and as you would climb, your airspeed indicator would drop down um, and not be accurate. It'd be reading much lower than what it was because this would be sealed up at a higher uh, ratio of air molecules and as you climb, your pitot tube for the same speed that you'd be going would be getting less air molecules within here, right? So that would be one of the errors of a clogged static port. As you climb, your airspeed indicator would drop and you would uh, not be getting an accurate reading on your indicator here. And of course, if it clogged at altitude from icing or whatnot, and as you descended, your airspeed indicator would start going up in speed or error on the higher side than what you would actually be doing. Um, and again, if it stayed clogged, um, you would be higher, uh, you're indicating higher on your airspeed for landing, which you would actually be flying slower and closer or maybe below that stall speed. Meanwhile, your airspeed indicator would be pointing up here, right? So that's a clogged static port. It would be similar to just sealing it up um, and not having a static port um, when you were either at altitude or on the ground. Next, we'll talk about the clogged pitot tube, right? So let's say the static port is working and measuring outside um, air molecules or, or the, the pressure, the static pressure outside, right? So at the ground, we'll have 100 in here. And then when we're flying, we'll have 200 there, right? So, uh, so it'll get, again, give us our accurate reading. Let's say a bug flies into the static port on your takeoff roll. Well, that 200 parts is gonna be stuck in this sealed balloon or this sealed wafer here. So this will stay about 200 parts in this closed chamber. Well, as you go up, the static pressure is gonna start going down. So instead of having 100 in this chamber, you go climb up to 18,000 feet. As you climb, this is gonna start losing those air molecules through the static port. So that 100 is gonna go down to 50. Well, now you'll have the 200 compared to 50 here. So your airspeed indicator is gonna actually read much higher. As you climb, your airspeed indicator is gonna start going up at the same time. And that would be your indication of a clogged pitot tube um, because your pressure in this capsule here would be going down, but this would be staying the same, right? And then of course, if it clogged, let's say at altitude, icing on the pitot tube uh, clogged it up um, when you were at 18,000 feet, let's say you had 100 parts in here and you had your 50 parts in that sealed chamber. As you descend, this 50 parts is gonna go up to 75 and then down to sea level, you'll go down to that 100 parts. So now you'll have 100 and 100. So as you descend, what's gonna happen is your airspeed indicator is gonna start dropping down or slowing down um, and not give you an accurate reading because that ratio is gonna be going down from that uh, original ratio or the, uh, the static air ratio to the pitot ratio. Now what happens if your pitot uh, tube and your static port get clogged? Well really, it's gonna get, when it gets clogged, it's just gonna freeze your airspeed where you, you left it or where, where it got clogged because you'll keep those ratios the same. So that's, a, I think, a little better explanation of how those pitot-static errors or um, issues arise versus um, kind of just remembering that that's how it happens. When you can actually see how this housing um, connects with the static port, right? That would be just like there. And then the pitot tube connecting to this wafer. So I hope this video cleared uh, the air on maybe some misconceptions or misunderstandings you had on the airspeed indicators. Um, I plan on doing uh, some other videos, kind of some reviews on the AV30. Uh, I've, I've been looking online, haven't seen too many people reviewing those, and I really think uh, it's a great equipment to have in your plane, relatively cheap to install um, and easy to install for a mechanic. Only uh, an hour or two, I think, to, uh, to get this AV30 attitude indicator in. I'm gonna do some reviews on the G5, how that integrates with the S-Tech 50, because it is a little different, um, especially with GPS steering um, and heading mode and how that, that kind of works together. So I'll 
it. So I'll do a video on that. Also want to do one on the uh, CGR 30s, how the engine uh, gauges work, um, which is really going to give me a better idea of how this engine um, is living and, and kind of operating um, as it's running. So stay tuned to those videos. Like I said, hit the subscribe button, the like button, the bell if you haven't yet, and uh, you'll be notified of upcoming videos. Also plan on doing a lot of trips, maybe some local trips in the area, and uh, gonna do some, some videos on those. So thanks for tuning in everybody, and uh, hope you enjoyed.